notes. Notes, 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 and that's the last goddamn hitchhiker I ever pick up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This movie has some fun lines, actually. Yeah. We're doing the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre from 1974. And this is a spoiler full episode. So if you've never seen this movie, go back and check out the primary episode where we talk spoiler free. That being said, we're going to dive right into it. That quote was so perfect because I laughed out loud when he said that because that's what I was thinking for the last like 10 minutes of this movie I wonder if this is the movie that killed hitchhiking apparently um I for- one of the actors it might have even been Franklin he talked about how some Texas state troopers shook his hand because I think after this movie came out like yeah you're right people just stopped picking up hitchhikers yeah I mean it's not hard to see why like We talked about, and we kind of danced around it in the primer episode, but the first, like, 15 minutes of this movie with the hitchhiker are, like, maybe one of the scariest scenes of a movie I've ever seen. Yeah, really. It's very, very, very upsetting. I think that kind of speaks to what you're kind of getting into with this movie as well. It's just, like, something not right about this something odd something off you know what before we get into any of that though there is one thing i have been dying to talk to you about okay what did you think of franklin this might be one of the most like longest discussions we have about this okay this is where and you talked about how good the writing of this was Mm -hmm. i think franklin is a very well written character in this movie i agree and like i haven't really done that much digging but like I think of the five main characters, I really felt the most connected to Franklin. Yes, but I also think that Franklin is written in a way... So Franklin is the character in this movie who is in the wheelchair. Yeah, he's Sally's brother. And yes, he's uh, paralyzed from the waist down. And the first like 20 minutes of this movie... I'm like, oh man, Franklin just can't catch a break here, right? Yeah. And he, like, things just keep getting worse for Franklin in the first 20 minutes, and then... There's a point in time in this movie that's really interesting because there's almost a shift in his character because we feel really sorry for this character who has a dis- disability, right, as mm-hmm. well. And that's hard, I think, for a movie to you know, then potentially kill this character off later in the film. I also wanted to say, and like again, I hope you've seen this movie, but yeah. like... I was shocked when Franklin got chainsawed. Right. Because in my mind, I was like, I thought Franklin was the main character. Right. Like, who the fuck is Sally? I don't know anything about Sally. Like, here's the thing that I think is really interesting and almost in a way subtle that kind of shifts how you see Franklin partway through this movie. Because, like I said, this movie does a really good job of making you feel empathy for franklin or for feel bad for like this really bad day that he's having yeah well we should say that the movie opens with the van pulls over they let him out and they hand him like a cough an empty coffee can so he can take a leak yeah and then a big old truck drives by and like the momentum or the wind knocks him down this hill yeah yeah. Right. Well, and I mean, he gets stabbed by the like hitchhiker and everything. Like that Franklin too. is not having a good day. You know, he gets basically forgotten about the minute they get to the house that they're going to. Yeah. But here's the thing about Franklin is, is when we really dive into the character of Franklin, he's kind of an annoying dude. Yeah. And Actually, s- I was going to say that like for maybe the first 10 minutes, I was a little like, this guy kind of sucks. Yeah. So like there is also this scene early on where like, he talks about like the old slaughterhouse and he goes into like intimate detail about how they used to kill the cattle there, right? right? He starts talking about how like they'd hit him with a sledgehammer and sometimes you have to do it a couple times. Mm-hmm. Then they invented this like blowgun thing that works even better. Right. I had a friend who uh, you know, lived on a dairy farm. They used to just put bags over the cows' heads. Huh. It was to asphyxiate them. Wow. Yeah. Anyways, moving on. <laughs> <laughs> so but he during those scenes, I was a little like He almost kind of seems like a precocious child. Right. Who just, he's interested in something and he won't shut the fuck up about it. Yeah. And so I think that what really shone to me watching this movie was there was a moment when you feel really bad for Franklin and, and, you know, you think that Franklin, because of this bad day that he's having, that maybe he'll survive because, you know, maybe that's his redemption or whatever you want to call it. But there's a point in time where Franklin kind of gets annoying and you kind of start to accept the fact that this character 
may die and not be ups- as upset about it. Because again, this is a character who's disabled and has been kicked around for the first half of this movie. And then they make him just annoying enough that when he dies, you're not horribly gutted by it. I don't know that I agree. I think I started off not liking him, but I think I started liking him more as the movie went along. Because guess what? Franklin's friends are dicks. Yeah. Like, I know. seriously, like, um, there's this scene where they get to the house and like Pam and I think Kirk, they go to them to find this watering hole. Right. And they're kind of just like, wow, this watering hole is really far out of the way. And, you know, Kirk says like, how did they get Franklin down here when he was a kid? And, mm-hmm. you know, Pam's like, well, someone must have carried him when he was little. And he goes, Franklin was never little. <laughs> and I was like, wow, that wasn't necessary. Right. Well, yeah. And they just like ditch him the minute they get to the house like nobody thinks about franklin at all so there is this scene that actually i felt was really poignant where so they get to the house and then so there's basically franklin sally her boyfriend and then pam and her boyfriend i think their names are like jerry and kirk or kirk and jerry yeah and there's this really kind of upsetting scene where they just ditch franklin and he kind of like wheelchairs into the house and by the way it was the 70s I don't know that anything was wheelchair accessible back then. I mean, it's an old, decrepit house, too. That's, that too, like, falling yeah. apart, right? Like, so, but there's this scene where, like, he's kind of on the first floor, and everyone else is upstairs, and, like, you can hear their laughter echoing from upstairs, and yeah. Franklin's, like, looking up yeah. and just kind of, like, frustratedly blowing raspberries. And, like, I was genuinely upset during that scene. Yeah. I was like, oh, yeah. Franklin. Yeah, it yeah. is a little upsetting. But, again, for me, this movie just pulled it back enough to make his death not be like an absolute gut punch kind of so thing. are you talking about the scene where like him and his sister are yes at the car and he's like don't go don't go don't go like i'm not gonna give you the flashlight like yeah. blah 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 and like he's being reasonable there too like i like i would say you know like what are they gonna do they're out in the middle of nowhere their four friends haven't shown up or their three friends it's have getting disappeared. dark yeah. he's in a wheelchair like yeah at one point he's like okay okay let's go but like i'm holding onto the flashlight and you know, but I'll come with you. And Sally kind of just frustratedly says, like, I can't take you with me. Right. Yeah. Well, and there's, and here's the other thing, too. Franklin's just got a point as well that, generally speaking, if they left the van to go look for them and then the other three come back to the van, are they in a better position at that point? Yeah. Right. Like, there's no winning here. There's no easy solution. And yeah, like, the like person who's really sensitive who's thinking about other people are gonna go you know we have to wait or we have to go find them kind of thing but i don't know if that's actually the objectively better option in this position well there's a really interesting moment in that scene where sally and franklin are just kind of alone and franklin just kind of says like you didn't want me to come on this trip did you and she kind of just looks at him and like she doesn't really answer and i thought that was interesting because it was very like I'm like, oh, there's something going on here, right? Right. Like, did she invite him out of pity, but, like, nobody really wanted him there? Right. Like, I don't know. I felt like we kind of got a slight glimpse into their sibling relationship, but, Mm -hmm. like, you know, it was just, like, a hint, right? Again, like you said, the characters are all, for the most part, underwritten, but the character of Franklin does really pop in this movie. Yeah, well, and then, again, it's funny. Like, Jerry, the other guy... Mm -hmm. there's a scene where so franklin's obviously really rattled by this whole experience with the hitchhiker yeah probably more rattled than anybody else but that's fair also because he's the one who got stabbed yeah but he's just like you don't think that guy's gonna find us do you and jerry's like oh yeah he's coming franklin (laughs) and he's like i gave him your address and zip code he's coming and i'm like i remember okay actually i want to read a note i just wrote kirk sucks (laughs) and then a little bit later, I wrote, Jerry also sucks. <laughs> <laughs> but here's the thing, though. When you're really scared and something like really frightening happens, sometimes you do and say things that don't really make a lot of sense or even help the situation, right? Like, sometimes your gut response is to be kind of a dick or joke about some things when something upsets you. Well, I think there was another scene where Jerry was kind of talking about Franklin. He's like, ah, oh, just shoot him and put us out of our misery, right? right. So... I don't know. And like, again, Franklin is, he's annoying. Actually, for the first 10 minutes, I was listening to him and I was a little like, is he maybe supposed to be a little bit like on the spectrum maybe? Right. Yeah. Like, does he have maybe a developmental disability? Mm -hmm. But I don't know. I don't think so. But yeah. Although at the same time, you know, to maybe the other character's defense, can you imagine being stuck in a road trip with someone you hate who's just annoying the fuck out of you? (laughs) 
<laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. Like, so I don't know. I mean, that said, I really, really felt for Franklin to the point where, so he gets chainsawed. Yeah. In this Texas Chainsaw Massacre movie. <laughs> and like, and the only one to get really chainsawed. And it, again, it's so sudden and it's so abrupt that, and I was shocked because I was like, because like I'm always trying to analyze things as a writer and mm-hmm. I was watching this movie and I was kind of like trying to like think three steps ahead of the movie where I'm like, okay, so it's going to be down to Franklin and like that's going to be a good source of tension because he's in a wheelchair, right? right? How's a guy in a wheelchair supposed to escape these cannibals? Then he gets chainsawed and we're stuck with Sally. And I'm like, oh. Even credit to this movie that it literally in the opening crawl tells you that this movie, the central character is Sally and Sally's the one who has this bad day. And you actually forget about it because of the events of this movie. You get sucked so far into it that the opening crawl just kind of becomes irrelevant in a sense. Yeah. Other I guess than so. setting the mood of the movie, it does like it's something that you kind of forget about. And there is something to that. Like, um, so I think Kirk is the first one to go, mm-hmm. and he wanders into the old house. Right. Which, you know, I, I, made, I made a joke that, like, I feel like all these characters are operating by, like, Bethesda rules or, like, <laughs> video game rules where it's like, yeah. I'm the main character. I can go wherever I want. Right? right. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, maybe that's the joke, that all these characters think they're the main character in this movie. But, mm-hmm. like, you know, he wanders into the house, and he's yelling for Pam. He's like, oh, you got to come check this out. And, like... You see all this like creepy imagery, yeah. And then Leatherface jumps out of nowhere and bonks him on the head. Yep. How effective did you find that moment? It's surprising how scared I was in that moment. Okay. I was kind of not expecting him to just jump out and like smash him on the head to the point that he goes into like seizure and basically dies in that. Yeah. The scene. So Kirk gets bonked on the head, collapses. And then it like, he starts kicking basically like, yeah. That's what's supposed to upsetting about it. Right. Yeah. yeah. I don't know what it is about watching somebody like have like a spastic fit. Yeah. As they're dying basically. But that's really upsetting. Yeah. No, very, very, very upsetting. So I actually didn't find the reveal that, intimidating Mm -hmm. and i get that maybe that was by design like it's supposed to be very like quick and like unceremonious but i was like oh that's it and then he starts kicking i'm like "Ooh, that's not good right yeah that definitely got to me i think that it's almost it's funny in a way because these characters all just kind of stumble into their own deaths more or less you know if these characters had decided not to go to the house to look for gas and then not gone into the house, and then not subsequently gone into the house looking for the last person who went into the house, then each one of them would have been fine at any point in time when you choose option B. Well, it's kind of funny. Like, I made a joke, again, in my notes, where it's like, Leatherface is just exercising his stand-your-ground rights. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> These fucking assholes just wander into his house, and he attacks them, Yeah, right? and so, yeah. like, there's almost an air of surprise to him when he shows up. He's like, ah! <laughs> like, yeah, there's like, whoa, okay. And there's even a moment that's actually kind of calm as well when he's trying to break into his own house when sally's gone up stairs into shut the door behind her yeah he starts chainsawing his own door right and so she runs down because of the bodies that are upstairs and she's on the stairwell and he walks in and she screams and he actually jumps back like he's jumps back in surprise at her because he's not expecting her to be right there and i think it's part of it is maybe as well like when you realize that this character of leatherface is also somebody who has like some sort of mental and physical disabled kind of thing and this movie walks a really fine line of like not villainizing like people with disabilities right or or like i was thinking especially watching franklin in the first half of the movie i'm like there really is like an ableist critique of this movie right you know like franklin is kind of treated like shit by everybody yeah because he's disabled also because he's annoying but (laughs) because he's disabled and yeah i was watching this movie and i was like what were things like in the 70s for people in wheelchairs Mm -hmm. like were things wheelchair accessible or i don't think we were even close to that point i think the 90s is what really kicked off the wheelchair accessibility but yeah so what did you do if you were in a wheelchair did people just have to you struggled man you struggled yeah shit i think that you know at that point as well that kind of it changes your perspective of what this character is going to be because i think if you know nothing about leatherface going into this like i did i was expecting leatherface to be this like diabolical villain who hacks people up and eats them and and like wears their skin and like he has this crazy elaborate home or like some scheme yeah you were expecting people you were expecting a bad guy yeah and in a way he's the bad guy but at the same time like i also slightly felt sorry for him a little bit like in this weird twisted way like 
I felt like his family were like more the ones who have created this crazy twisted environment where this like this leather faced character has just been like forced into doing some of these things and become this monster that he's become. So again, spoiler alert, but it's the spoiler section. Like the hitchhiker and this old man who runs a local store, they're all brothers. Yeah. And he's essentially like the brute. Yeah. They just kind of tell him what to do. Mm-hmm. Like, so the and old- they treat him like shit too. Yeah. The old man character is like, you know, he's constantly telling him like, what a damn fool he is and like hitting him with like a little bent machete and all that stuff. Yeah. Right. So by the way, um, I thought the old man character was his dad. I did as well. And there's a little bit of ambiguity, even online, there's a little bit of ambiguity. Although the director did say that he was written as the brother character or written as a brother character, but I think it fits a little bit better if he's a father, if he's a father figure. Yeah. yeah. Especially too, with the grandfather stuff that comes later. Um, yeah, that was also very upsetting. The grandfather thing is maybe the best twist in the movie that I kind of, I was shocked and surprised, but also like somewhat proud that this movie went where it went. I was yeah. like, th- I was like, that's really cool. And I've never seen that. I don't And by think. cool, I mean upsetting. Uh, yeah, yeah, like genuinely upsetting, right? Because you think that this character who Sally sees in the room is just like another corpse and so yeah, when Sally's running around, she bursts into a room, and it looks like there's these two corpses propped up. Yeah, like grandpa and grandma, like sitting in chairs. Yeah. And then like even at the point when they're like, "Oh, go get grandpa, go get grandpa," and they go and grab grandpa from upstairs, I still think they're grabbing a corpse at that point, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then it's not until grandpa starts sucking the blood out of sally's finger that i was like oh my god Ah, he's alive i literally like jumped like in my chair i was like oh my god this is actually like a living human being right now like still like it just blew my mind like it completely took me out like i was not expecting that at all i was shocked no and then he does a little like jig when he gets some blood right that was and then sally faints and like i might have fainted too but like (laughs) yeah Apparently, that was, like, a 20-year-old guy just wearing, like, heavy prosthetics. Mm, I see, like, I wouldn't have even guessed that. Like, the prosthetics are really good on him yeah. as well. Yeah. Like, he, he, like I said, he looks like a corpse for the first half of the movie. That And, and you don't expect, like, that's one of the great twists is that if you've come to this movie and you've seen Psycho, you might expect to see, like, like these corpses that have almost mummified that people are keeping like as relics of their families sure but when he starts moving it's just like so dark and twisted and unexpected that like I- i've genuinely kudos to this movie for doing that no to me. yeah i think they said he was like he's supposed to be like over 120 years old <laughs> like moment of just applause for yeah that. wow that was really upsetting good work everyone <laughs> good work speaking of, of upsetting we didn't get to talk about this in as much detail in the primer episode, and I really want to talk about this, but even the first five minutes, like the effectiveness of opening with the crawl and explaining that this is a true story and then going into the radio show, generally speaking, I can sometimes like tune out or like think about the movie like from a big picture while the credits are rolling these older movies where like, you know, the credits are just over like you know, a black sure, screen yeah, or whatever yeah. kind of thing. Like Batman, Mask of the Phantasm. They do like an opening crawl of yeah, like Gotham City. And like, I'll talk to Jess during that or whatever while we're watching a movie. I was genuinely like listening and hanging on to every word in that radio show because mm. there was something very, I think there's something very particular about what they were going for with that. Like, because it talks about the grave and like the grave robbery and like, it's really disgusting and disturbing that this would happen. Yeah. But then it kind of just goes on into like other disgusting things in the news and it kind of just gets drowned out. There's something really unsettling about a movie that is like this upsetting and this like infamous and everything and having it start on a radio show where it's just like, this is just like a drop in the ocean. Yeah. And I'm glad you brought that up. No, it's like, yeah, there's been a spring of uh, grave robberies. Anyway, moving on. Yeah. Like, to all know. the other like sick and depraved things that are happening. You're in the like, world. wow, it really is the seventies. Yeah. It's, and that is also a sign of the seventies too, right? The seventies post Vietnam is like a really paranoid and, you know, I don't know what the word is. It was definitely a very 2020s kind of place. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what, maybe that's why I love going back to these 70s 70s movies is because they more so feel tapped into like 
generational frustration and anger than even like some of the movies that we're getting now apart no, from yeah. like the substance aside but <laughs> <laughs> yeah good movie good movie yeah and even like them talking about the slaughterhouse and stuff as well and like framing it in this way of like you know casually like these horrible things happen but that's how we survived like that's how we live is like by doing these dirty yeah, things. yeah that... and like there's that great moment with the hitchhiker in the car when franklin starts talking about using the bolt gun and the hitchhiker's like no no like the old way is better right? right and he's i think he says like my grandfather used to work there or something like that yeah yeah and it kind of like speaks to again like this anger and frustration of the 70s of like people losing their jobs to automation and stuff like that and like that's kind of something that people have really read into about the theme of this movie is just like the incoming wave of industrialism and and capitalism into maybe even like these small communities that get by on you know it could be something like a slaughterhouse or whatever and like these dirty jobs that have to be done and then they're automated and these people lose their jobs and are just like basically forsaken yeah what are you supposed to do at that point right yeah yeah that and that's their livelihood and everything right so even just driving by like the slaughterhouse and all the cows was really unsettling yeah really well and i mean it's a movie so you can't smell it but they even mentioned like oh my god what's that smell yeah like yeah and i've been in a slaughterhouse and i can confirm there's some interesting smells that can come out of places like that when were you in a slaughterhouse i can't really get into details about it so okay interesting <laughs> But oh, that's some juicy Blake lore that none of us are privy to. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then even getting from that into picking up the hitchhiker, the movie just never lets up, really. Like, I'm just genuinely upset from the get-go, and I am never just have a moment where I get bored or, like, I start to come down or start to get, like, distracted or in my own head. Like, I'm just fully present for right from the get-go. But that hitchhiker scene, like, when he's... You know, I just want to speak to, like, how effective that scene is yeah there he does so much and it's so scary for just being a character sitting there and doing weird things for 10 minutes yeah i don't even know that it was 10 minutes i mean it felt like an hour yeah. right? and again that's what's so upsetting about this movie is like again we've all had been in social situations with someone we're like this person seems normal then they start talking like oh no yeah i gotta get i um i don't know if i should tell this story but i'm going to um <laughs> I used to work as a full-time journalist, and I remember going to this person's house one time to interview him, mm -hmm. and he was just kind of this tall, skinny, bald, older guy, mm -hmm. but I walked into his house, I shut the door behind me, I looked at the guy, and I was just instantly like, oh, I'm in danger. Right. Like, something's off about this guy, yep. right? Like, my skin just started crawling, Yeah. and I couldn't really put my finger on it, but I just interviewed him really quickly and then got the hell out of there. Yeah. And I remember him being like, oh, do you want to come out to my garage? Like, I got some cool stuff back there. I'm like, I'm good. <laughs> and then I remember being like talking to my art guy. And I'm like, hey, if you need to go back for some pictures, like maybe I should come with you. Right. I've never had an experience like that before or since. But like that, maybe that's why this hitchhiker scene was so particularly upsetting to me. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. I, I actually saw I was driving from Jason's in Kingston to my cottage and it was a three hour drive by myself through like just absolute wilderness and I was like I said completely by myself I don't that's my first time doing this drive by myself this year and on my drive I kind of happened upon this old man who was hitchhiking in the middle of nowhere and I looked at him and he looked at me as I drove by and I said absolutely not while I drove by him and that's the end of that story wow congratulations Blake <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah it was terrifying because of how remote i was in upper ontario and this old guy just out in the middle of nowhere like very unsettling and like his expectation of getting hitchhiking and getting picked up was just like i was like have you not seen a movie in the last yeah. 50 years like yeah no kidding and again that's kind of what we said back in the primary episode that this hitchhiking scene is so effective that I got to imagine this just like shut the door on anybody hitchhiking. Like, like you said as well, like crime went down, like in Texas alone, I think I read that the stats were like crime went down like 18% over a couple years and almost exclusively because people just stopped picking up hitchhikers. Can you imagine that like in the old days, people used to just do that willy nilly? Mm -hmm. Like, oh, look, a stranger, I'll give him a lift, right? Right. Like... And it was courteous and it was like the nice thing to do. But at the same time, like, 
you don't know who you're picking up. It's funny. One time my dad picked up a hitchhiker. While he, you were in the car? No, he was alone. <laughs> I don't think I was even, I think I was just a twinkle in his eye. Okay. But he told my mom and she just about blew a gasket. Mm-hmm. She's like, you're not doing that again. Yeah. yeah. I, I have like a separate story and we don't have time to get into this, but I one time helped boost a car for a person who was very obviously a drug dealer. Um, <laughs> and it was a very interesting experience, but I'll, I'll talk about that maybe another time. That's I a remember, story for another time. And- I remember one time having to call for a boost, and yeah. um, the CAA guy showed up, and I looked at him, and I was like, oh, no. <laughs> and like he just talked my ear off about nothing for like 10 minutes. I was like, yeah, 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 okay, yeah. And then I was like, all right, thanks for your help, and then I just drove away. I think what these experiences are kind of getting to, kind of relating them back to this it's movie. that other people are terrifying and should be stayed away from. Yeah, like, you know, we're kind of, a lot of us live in our bubbles of the people that we've known for a long time, our whole lives or whatever, and, like, some of us, yeah, some of us have, like, public-facing jobs or whatever, and you can see some of the depravity in human beings and stuff like that in, in those kind of areas or, or environments, but, you know, for somebody like me, like, there isn't a lot of times when I feel kind of out of my element or like, you know, like I'm a white dude, right? Like walking out on the street Woo! at night is yeah, like, baby. I don't think about that, right? That sort of stuff. And there's something that in this movie that just kind of reminds you that like, there are people out there that don't care about you, that are actively in a position to take advantage of your ignorance and your goodwill, your good nature kind of thing. And those people do exist. And here is a little snapshot of like the scariest of the scary. And we should people. say there's not a lot of them, but they are out there. Yeah. You know? It's yeah. kind of funny and you can cut this out, but um, I was leaving my second job last night and you know, you know me, I like to dress a certain way. I like to look kind of spiffy. And uh, I was walking to my car and I looked and there were two, uh, there was a car parked next to my car and it was these two younger I'm just going to say kind of white trash looking dudes, (laughs) like dude bro looking dudes. Right. And I looked at them and they looked at me and they're like, look at this dude. And I just was like, nope. Yeah. I'm like, I'm not going to say anything. I just got in my car, drove away. Yeah. I was like, I'm not dealing with this tonight. I I had an experience like that at a gas station in the US once and it was very similar experience. I was like, I am in the wrong place at the wrong time right now. Yeah, really? Well, I, I thought of a few like snappy comebacks. I'm like, I got to record a. I got to record a podcast tomorrow. I can't get my head cracked open. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think everybody's experienced a situation in which they're in the wrong place at the wrong time, and you acknowledge that. And this movie is the ultimate wrong place, wrong time movie, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely. And like, even when they stumble upon like the car graveyard, like there's something about that, even and just nobody being around, that's really deeply unsettling. Like, let's let's not go any further. Into there this. is something to like you know remoteness being alone and then running into another person yeah now granted i'm you and i are both kind of indoorsy people so we can't really relate but like i remember my friend telling me about like going climbing mountains out west and like sometimes you just run into another person out there and you just look at each other like are you a serial killer yeah i don't know are you a serial (laughs) killer like yeah yeah. yeah. no i get exactly what you mean like jess and i traveling in scotland like earlier this uh year definitely like there was instances where you're just out in the middle of nowhere and you're like you're also here why are you here i know i'm here for good but yeah why are you here yeah right so no i get it and it's also too like and i i was at the grocery store a couple weeks ago and there was this woman running across the parking lot being chased by a security guard because she had stolen something Hmm. and she was just screaming her head off oh my god Clearly, me and some other guy were like, uh, but it turned out it was a security guard and she'd been caught stealing something. Right. And she just started screaming racial slurs at this guy. And like, it was pretty clear she was like mentally unwell or on something. (sighs) Yeah. You know, and then me and this other guy were just kind of like, uh, and I was like, I'm not getting involved. I just got in my car and drove away. (laughs) (laughs) So, by the way, that's how most of my stories end. I got in my car and drove away. (laughs) But, like,. But you know what? Maybe that's the conclusion of the story. Yeah, right. Don't but... go poking around at things that you have no business poking around in. Yeah, I'm like, I'm in. My, I'm going to stay in my lane. So, but no, yeah. And it was just because, you know, we're in polite society, but it's so weird just seeing someone completely losing their mind, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, for sure. And, you know, I'm sure that woman is a decent person. She's just very unwell, and I hope she's okay. But, like, right. anyways... Can we talk about the bone room and the moment when I think, what was her name? Not Sally, but the other woman. Pam, girl B. Yeah, when Pam 
wanders into the house and stumbles into what I call the bone room. The bone room. There's something genuinely scary because of how authentic this room looks. Like I imagine a lot of those bones were real and I inside baseball a little bit reading on on things like it it sounded like a lot of this was real taxidermy and stuff. But there's something like deeply disturbing about wandering into a room and also knowing like Ed Gein and some of these other like famous horror uh, or famous serial killers or infamous serial killers of the past and like and how they would collect bones and other gross weird human body parts Mm -hmm. i think that when you're watching this movie and it'd be really cool to see this movie in a theater thinking about the silence of that scene and thinking about the silence in your own room and just like really wrapping your head around like how horrific this is yeah right and then she finds what's his face kirk yeah. in the freezer and he's still alive all of that is just horrifying like even when leatherface picks up pam and puts her on the meat hook oh my god is that scary very thematically appropriate yeah <laughs> i do that's one of those moments that hasn't aged super well because he, she gets put on the meat hook and there's no sound and you don't really see the hook go into her so I don't feel like that really held up, but it's very- I don't know. I was genuinely pretty upset by it. And like, also I haven't, there's probably another movie like this, like another slasher movie where somebody gets put on a meat hook, but I don't know if I've ever seen somebody like, so like alive and aware on a, just like casually on placed hook. on a meat yeah. hook like that. Like there's something visually very upsetting about that still, even though you maybe don't hear what you think you're going to hear. Oh, yeah. And like, you know, Leatherface is like a six foot four, 300 pound dude. Yeah. And she's like a tiny woman. Right. Like it's. He just manhandles her over to it. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. Like sometimes you just, you know, like I'm kind of tall, but every now and then I see other dudes and I look up at them like, wow. (laughs) Right. Jesus Christ. What about the gas station attendant? Like what? How did you find that? Like, how did you find his entrance into the movie and then subsequent, like, re-entrance into the movie later? So I was kind of like, when we first meet him, I was kind of thinking of, like, you know, the gas station attendant from South Park, you know, like, yeah, yeah, a lot of history down that road, you know? <laughs> so I was kind of like, because he's kind of creepy looking. But he like, warns them away. He warns them not to go to this house. And he's like, why don't you stay here and have some barbecue? By the way, the barbecue is probably human remains. Correct. But... um. <laughs> I was kind of thinking, this guy's kind of weird, but I was kind of like, see, this is my thing. I'm always trying to outsmart movies. Mm. I'm just like, oh, you know what? He's probably going to turn out to be a good guy. He's just kind of creepy, you know? He's the Tucker and Dale of this, of this movie. I don't get that reference, but yes. And um, <laughs> so I'm like, okay, he's kind of creepy. So like, they're probably trying to make him seem off-putting, but he's probably going to come back later and be cool, right? Right. But then, you know, Sally runs away, runs into him, and he's all like, oh, don't worry, I'll help you, blah, blah, mm-hmm. blah, blah. So I'm like, okay, this guy's going to get axed, right? Yes. But then he comes back with rope and ties her up. There's a, a few moments in the scene that kind of throw me out of uh, like my comfort zone and like make me question whether this guy is in on things or not. And the first moment is when Leatherface doesn't follow her into the the place and just kind of like he just kind of like sneaks off off. yeah yeah that's the first indicator to me that something's not quite right here and that's i like and this is me in real time working this out so that that kind of tips me off something's not quite right here and then he's like okay well let's get out of here like i can i can help you kind of thing he walks out to go grab his truck and he leaves the door open. Yeah, when that happened, I was a little like, um... And there's something upsetting about the fact that he leaves the door open there, but Leatherface isn't out there to immediately kill him or wander back into this and grab Sally. Yeah. And that's like strike two. And then strike three is the lingering look over to the barbecue pit. And none of it quite looks like human remains, doesn't there, look right, though. There's something sinister about the redness of it and the way that everything is displayed in there. That whole time, I'm like, this isn't going to end well. No. And then he comes back, and it's revealed that he is also in on everything. And I think what kind of is interesting about his character as well is how he's introduced, and he warns them away from this, and he kind of makes... He's creepy and weird, but at the same time, he kind of makes you feel like he's on their side. Like he's trying to 
warn them away from He's these like, evils. He's like, oh, come on. Those girls don't want to go poking around some old house. Yeah. You know? And if you've seen the movie Barbarian that came out like in the last couple years. I was thinking of Barbarian watching this movie. Yeah. And there's definitely elements of Barbarian that are influenced by this as well. But there's like a character very specifically in Barbarian that you think of as one thing and then truly in the end is actually quite another thing yeah Yeah. you know like these two movies are almost in conversation with each other because it's kind of the opposite here like i start to think that this character may be like one of the helpful characters that yeah okay maybe he's going to tragically die but he's going to help sally out here but thinking about this movie and really thinking about the writing of this movie i think he was warning them away because the heat was too big right now at that particular moment because of the grave robbings oh you know i didn't really think about that i assumed that they were warning them away and then he was gonna like gank them or something but But you're right there's a scene later on when the hitchhiker shows up and he's kind of like giving him a wailing he's like oh you damn fool like what'd you go to the cemetery for i told you not to do that right exactly and the hitchhiker's like nobody saw me come on right exactly and so I actually, like, thinking about it as a whole, I've realized that, no, this character is just trying to get them out of here because he doesn't want the heat on them. He doesn't want this situation that's already, like, big and could come down on them. He's trying to just kind of let things quiet down and not have these characters show up and meddle in their affairs. So he's trying to send them away, not out of the kindness of his heart, but out of self-preservation. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. And that's just another, like, little layer of writing that I really appreciate. So it is kind of, it's terrifying when, like, it turns out he's in on it, and then Leatherface, and then the Hitchhiker, and then how upsetting is that dinner scene? Oh, my God. See, okay, this is what I was talking about last week. I knew there was some kind of fucked up dinner scene in this movie, Mm -hmm. right? So... Sally essentially gets, she basically gets tied to a chair and then they're all having dinner together. Right. And they're all eating her friends. Yes. Yeah. It's upsetting because she's just tied there and has to watch and, and these characters are so twisted and insane. They, and like not really getting along either. No. Yeah. Yeah. Like it's, yeah, it is almost worse that none of them like there's no cohesion in them like they're just like have you ever been to like a dinner or something with a couple or you know have you ever been out with another couple and they kind of start fighting and you're just sitting there like uh yeah what do i do yeah right right it's really creepy and weird and like and you know grandpa alive really twists things and makes things go can i just say like how funny is it though when like Sally gets tied up yeah. or knocked out or something, and it doesn't cut. Like, I feel like mm-hmm. if I were writing this movie, I would cut to then the dinner scene. But, like, we see the proprietor, the barbecuer, tie her up, throw her in his truck. He keeps whacking her with his little right. machete thing. Yeah, and talking stuff. to her. and Yeah. Yeah, and then how funny is it when, like, he starts to leave, stops, realizes he left the light on and goes back to turn it off. He's like, yeah. oh, the cost of electricity. It's enough to drive a man out of business. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So. It's great. Yeah, it's it, again, adds to the realism, the authenticity of this world. And then they decide they want Grandpa to kill her, and they keep saying, like, Grandpa's the best killer there ever was. I'm like, oh, this is, like, some kind of, like, this is a twisted family. Yes. Like murder's been passed down for generations. Right. I also thought it was really interesting how like the hitchhiker kind of turns on the barbecuer, which is how I'm just going to be referring to him now. Yep. And he's basically like, all you do is cook. Like me and him do all the work. And then the barbecuer's like, I never got no pleasure from killing blah, 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 blah. Right. But then when they're about to kill her, you see him watching and he's smiling. Yeah. It's like, no, you're into it, man. That And that even that speaks to like, the different levels of depravity that people have because there's actually another, and I was going to talk about this in a few minutes, but this is heavily based on Ed Gein, but it's also based on this guy in Texas named Elmer Wayne Henley, who back in, I think it was the sixties or seventies. Um, he was involved in a number of serial killings where he mostly was the guy who got other people to show up to be killed by the serial killer. Oh, so he was like a serial killer duo. Yeah, and he actually eventually, it was actually a trio of them because the guy, there was one guy who was the murderer, the serial killer, and there was he had two helpers with him. I read all about this story. Interesting. Yeah. You hear about serial killer teams, like duos. You never hear about a trio, though. And it was actually like this guy, this Elmer Wayne Henley guy, who eventually grew a conscious and like, 
got upset by some of the stuff that they were doing and he actually murdered the serial killer and then told the cops and then they found all the bodies and everything afterwards and i'm i was kind of surprised because i had you know i think that a lot of people have their phase of like serial killers maybe you watch seven when you're 17 for a second or i thought you were about like to that. say we all have our phases of serial killing i'm like blake <laughs> there's something you need to tell us yeah the, no you just like a lot of i feel like you know some people just get into true crime or other people you know you watch seven and then you're kind of like you have this weird fascination with these serial killers and like these kind of movies and stuff and like i was surprised that i hadn't heard about this this group before but you can really see the inspiration of that in this but these two like Ed Gein, you know, he also inspired Psycho and The Science of the Lambs and, like, all these other movies that are really interesting, like, how how deeply, like, into the psyche these movies kind of go into, like, these real events and these real despicable human beings in history. You know, I was listening to a podcast about necrophilia recently. <laughs> um, someone recommended it to me. Oh, Don't ask. Jesus. It's called Last Podcast on the Left for anyone interested and what I find really disturbing is they were talking about Ed Gein, and apparently he got caught and spent the final 30 years of his life in prison. Mm -hmm. What I think is really scary is apparently he was a model prisoner. Like, yeah. he was a really nice guy. I believe it. Yeah, and like something about that to me is really upsetting, you know? Because you think of these people as monsters, and they are, but at the same time, they're also humans as well. Yeah, and humans... And I think this is what I found so captivating about Game of Thrones back in the day is, like... Oh, like in the right circumstances, you could do evil, but in other circumstances, you can be good. Right. Yeah. Right? People aren't as black and white as you generally maybe put them in or group them as. No. Yeah. Gross. <laughs> but uh, anyways, so I do find it a little amusing that Sally goes through two different windows in this movie. Yeah. I mean, can I just say as well, like absolute kudos to the performer who plays Sally, like this is really one of the best like final girl performances that I've seen in a movie period. She looks like she is running for her life. Like I believe this woman is scared she's about out of to her die. pants. Yeah. 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 I don't even know how she's able to tap into that kind of fear, but I really truly believed that she thought she was going to die. No. Yeah. All the actors are super believable. Although to be fair, like, I wanted Franklin to be the final girl. <laughs> I almost kind of feel like there's some kind of weird parallel between Leatherface and Franklin. Yeah. No, there definitely is. That's kind of why, again, I was so shocked that he got chainsawed. Yeah. I mean, it's his, I guess it's kind of the conclusion to their parallel, them, them mirroring each other in a sense, right? Like they're both cast out by their families or like considered the black sheep of their families and not respected. And then this other one is, like, the final evolution of just, like, this uncaring, like, killing machine who just, like, does what he's told or does, like, you know, what's expected of him kind well, of Well, and that's the thing. We get so little from Leatherface. We're like, do you, does he even know what he's doing? Right. Like, does he even comprehend his own actions? Right. Like, And then, again, we should actually talk about the ending. Actually, I'll just ask. What did you think of the ending? I think the ending is also somewhat unexpected in the sense that, like, she gets to the road and then she flags down a trucker after the trucker runs over the hitchhiker, the hitchhiker, which is like absolutely wild, like unexpected that the hitchhiker dies in that kind of so way. So random. It almost... But also like poetic in a sense. Yeah. Right. Like there is something there. Part of me, like the very critical writer part of my brain is like, this is a little deus ex machina, right? Right. But I mean- you're right. There is something satisfying about it. Yeah. Even though I do kind of admit, I'm like, I feel like this guy had plenty of time to get out of the way, but right. like, you know. <laughs> yeah. So then anyways, this hitchhiker, just this no this guy, he pulls over and then Leatherface shows up. This guy grabs a wrench and hucks it at Leatherface. Yeah. Hits him right between the eyes and knocks him over. And yeah. I was like, who is this guy? <laughs> like, why wasn't the movie about him, right? <laughs> yeah so then wouldn't, wouldn't that be an interesting intro into a movie where the movie is just the last five minutes of this movie is just the intro to from the movie? trucker's perspective yeah. yeah like oh what the fuck yeah like, yeah like you just happen upon this crazy thing happening yeah and i feel like that's happened to me before in the past where like i just wander in I'm yeah like, what's going on oh oh no yeah right? yeah so yeah and then Leatherface gets knocked over, tears open his own leg. With yeah, his own the chainsaw. chainsaw falls on his own leg. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then another truck just happens by, mm -hmm. and then Sally hops in. So the one trucker just books it in the other direction. Yeah. 
And then Sally just hops in the bed of this truck and, and like gets away. Absolutely covered in blood, right? Yeah, and screaming her head off. And laughing like this like scream laugh that's like if you've ever pushed yourself to a limit in a sense and no, then succeeded never. at it. <laughs> There's something very gratifying about it. And like again, this is, speaks to like Sally's performance. And I should shout out the actor who plays Sally because like I said, I one of the performances of the year for me for sure. It's uh Marilyn Burns. There's something like so satisfying watching her get away and watching her satisfaction at getting away. You know, there's that moment of like triumph kind of thing. And then it's not that that we end with though. It's the what we end with is Leatherface almost in like exasperation dancing around with the chainsaw. Yeah, that was incredibly apparently that was unscripted too. Correct. The guy just did it. I feel like in a worse movie, it would be silly. Yes. And it is a little silly, but it's horrifying. Yes. There's something horrifying about it. I also wanted to say, so we have this horrible dinner scene. Sally manages to break out and jumps through the window. <laughs> again. And, again. And when we get outside, we realize it's dawn. Yes. And something about that contrast really yeah. unnerved me, right? Right. I um, I interviewed a Holocaust survivor once. Wow. And she talked about watching people get, she talked about her family getting marched into the woods. Oh my God. And she described how she's, you know, these Nazis were marching her family into the woods and she looked up and realized it was a really nice day. And she's like, how could something like this be happening on so nice of a day? Wow. That's, that's sorry. That was heavy. But that was heavy, but yeah. no, but you're right. Like it's almost unexpected in a sense. Like it's jarring that these characters are just sitting down for dinner with Sally and it's actually broad daylight out and yeah. you have no, it's almost disorienting in There's a way. There's something like cosmically unjust about it. Yeah. And even like jumping back a bit, like Pam was reading from her book of horoscopes and they've just ousted the hitchhiker and she reads Franklin's horoscope. And it's something like be wary of like strange travelers and you may have a bad day. Like, yeah. And then, you know, they notice later that the hitchhiker who tore open his hand left like a bloody handprint in their car. Yeah. Like it's almost looks like a weird symbol. There's something almost cosmic about this movie. Mm -hmm. It's like a weird sense of like finality or inevitability or yeah. like, it's kind of like how, what we were talking about with like, Mask of the Phantasm, where like being Batman is almost like this preordained curse right. that Bruce Wayne can't escape. Right. The other thing, too, though, is like we have no idea what happened to the trucker. No. And I think the actor who played him admitted that he thought he was probably run down by the family and killed. Yeah. I mean, it's like, absolutely what, possible. What else right? are you going to do? But at the same time, I remember thinking Sally's like, like watching that and being like, why isn't Sally going to go back for him? But like, if you're that scared out of your mind, I'm not going back. Like, yeah. I'm like, ah, he'll be fine. Actually, there's even something to be said about that as well, that the actress who plays Pam, uh, her theory is that Pam actually escapes out of the freezer and gets away. Oh, okay. Good for her. I mean, <laughs> hey, I mean, whatever, right? You're allowed your own interpretation. Yeah, yeah, If yeah. I've ever had extra movie and I get killed, I'm just going, ah, I probably- Didn't happen. Probably lived. <laughs> <laughs> I probably pulled a sword out of my butt and kicked the shit out of Leatherface. <laughs> nice. I'm actually just going to read a couple notes that I had. <laughs> okay. I actually took notes this time, and I'm unjustifiably proud of myself. <laughs> so I'm just going to read a couple of them at random. You really, really feel for Franklin, even when he's blowing raspberries. Kirk sucks. <laughs> His legs kicking after a bullet of the head is disturbing. Jerry also sucks. <laughs> Then after that, I wrote, the world will not miss Jerry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, those are my notes. Nice. Sequels, prequels, and reboots. I mean, this is the movie that started it all, right? And wow, this is a big franchise. Like a surprisingly large franchise if you're not So large that he finally, Leatherface finally got on Fortnite. <laughs> I hope yeah. we're on Fortnite someday. Wow, that would be something. Yeah, that's when we'll know we've made it. <laughs> there are nine movies total in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre larger universe there's i think maybe three or four that kind of are sequels to this and then there's maybe two-ish reboots and maybe another sequel to that there's a chance i saw the tw 2003 texas chainsaw massacre like that's the one with jessica bale right jessica bale yeah, yeah. bale jessica bale jessica bale <laughs> <laughs> just like her brother christian <laughs> <laughs> no and i think that there is a chance that i've seen that movie but i can't remember it well enough there's also two video game adaptations it's on fortnite which is wild and we've talked about a lot of the inspirations for this movie so effects and filming the 
other inspiration of Leatherface, I I read this, but I couldn't find where the the actual like source was for this. But apparently, allegedly, part of the inspiration for Leatherface was uh, the director Hooper was at a party in his younger days, and his friend who was a pre med student showed up at the party wearing the face of a cadaver as like a joke Halloween costume and like that's like a real cadaver yeah yeah yeah. gross he was wearing their face and like yeah like that's something that if you ever saw that it would probably stick in your brain forever like I'm sure most people at some point in time have seen something on the internet that that makes them go well that's enough interneting for one day that would be yeah, like me every night at midnight <laughs> i'm just like i gotta go to bed yeah but that in something like that that's like the og like okay that's enough life for one day i'm going to bed <laughs> yeah but it's wild like how low of a budget this movie was made on like it was made with 140 grand i think um, they say that's like 700 grand yeah by something like that today. standards yeah which is still like which micro, that, micro that budget. doesn't even pay for craft services anymore <laughs> Jesus. No, it doesn't. Like, you know, you think about something. There's a couple movies like Creep and other like low budget horror movies that you and I really love. I feel like you and I could probably make something cool for $700,000. Yeah. It'd have to be scrappy, though. Yeah. But that's kind of the thing, though, is these movies are all a little scrappy, right? Mm-hmm. You know, over the years, like, there's been a lot of directors who have gotten their starts in like scrappy, low budget horror movies. And I think that that's kind of. It's really cool that people can make these like ele- like this is almost i wouldn't say it's an elevated horror movie but it's it's better than 90 percent of horror movies that are out there i would say um like there's a reason why leatherface is so iconic and this film has such like a notoriety behind it because it's genuinely that good it is really really good yeah yeah absolutely i mean I don't even like horror movies, and I had a really good time. Yeah. So I actually watched this movie yesterday afternoon, mm-hmm. just because that was the window I had. Yep. And I remember kind of thinking, I really should have watched this at night, but I was also kind of like, I'm kind of glad I didn't, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And like, you know what? I was unsettled the whole time. Like, yep. I was watching it in bed by myself, and like, just like, oh, like my stomach was twisting. I was yep. feeling all keyed up. I was like, this is weird. Like, like I said, there's never a moment that hold, that pulls back at all or just like there's never a moment to let you breathe at any point. No, and as someone who enjoys torturing characters and readers, I really admire that. <laughs> We've talked about how this movie opens with the based on a true story idea. Hooper himself, like he wrote that and it was kind of like a an angry response to the Vietnam War and like what he felt was about like the government lying to them about some of the what atrocities was going on in the yeah world. yeah and stuff like that like and a response to like Watergate and the oil crisis of the 70s and all of that sort of stuff and i thought that was really interesting as well that like it, that kind of taps into something that kind of like paranoia of the 70s right and and just like distrust like that's probably the 70s and now are probably the two times where faith in government and police and authority is at their lowest especially now i hate to say it but there's just this kind of you know there's this election coming up and everyone i know just doesn't care anymore yeah you know it's almost like we're all just burnt out on show tunes yeah exactly so yeah and if you want to watch the conclusion of that uh go check out threads which will upset you in ways that you didn't think you could be upset by there's any politician (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> all right i was gonna say we so- ain't dipping into the politics ever and you know what i should say if there are any politicians that would like to appear on our podcast i would like to encourage them to do so so i can tell them to fuck off to their face uh that's always gonna be hard no we're never gonna have anybody who's a politician on a movie podcast because i don't care but i want to tell them to fuck off to their face well do that in your own time yeah oh you know what fair enough i will <laughs> <laughs> you know what that's a fair compromise <laughs> I thought as well that the painstaking, the grueling task of making this movie kind of fascinated me. Yeah, this is, um, I started watching the making of documentary. Oh, no way. Yeah, I didn't get that far into it. I also did some reading. And apparently this is one of those, like, this is one of those nightmare productions. Yeah, like, like they did film it in Texas, which generally speaking is known as a pretty hot state. Just it was a little. like record-breaking heat, like 100 degree weather every day. They were shooting constantly for like a month or so in this like very hot heat. They were indoors filming in this house, you know, like even in the scene where the kitchen scene, 
they were filming in during the day, like you said, so that they could do that shot at the end. But while they were filming in there, they had the curtains drawn to make it look like it was still night out. And that made it even hotter in there. And then to top all of that off, the meat that they had out on the plates and then all of the taxidermy being in this, like, it was like 120, 140 degrees Fahrenheit in there. And, like, all of this stuff just starts to stink over the hours that they're filming this. Started, like, spoiling, yeah. right? And yeah. And so part of the reason why they did this, and they shot that scene, like, that the scene in there, they spent, like, 20, over 26 hours or something like that shooting that scene. And part of it was because the actor playing the old man and all of that uh, prosthetics and everything was so grossed out by being in that he was like this is the only time i'm filming my shots is like let's get it all done all in one go kind of thing so that guy was just like i'm not doing this shit like yeah yeah. and so all of this compounding into the smell and like the disgust and the hours like there were actors who were actually like and and cast members or crew members who would have to go out and throw up because of the stench and the the heat and the smell and then come back in and continue filming i don't want to i feel like we shouldn't romanticize self-destructive behavior but like there is something weirdly admirable about, okay i just need to throw up real quick and then i'll do another take like yeah bleh. all right let's do this right it's almost like vigo morrison getting a his tooth knocked out during a fight scene with an orc and just being like, just glue it back in so we can finish the scene. Yeah. These are why these people get paid the big bucks in a sense, right? I don't think any of these people made big bucks. They (laughs) did. They they did get to live on forever in an immortal horror movie, Yeah, which is kind of worth something. Even on that note, like the amount of injuries on this set were wild. Like even in the kitchen scene, like the when they cut open sally's finger that was actually them like they really cut open sally's finger and yeah. fed like real blood to grandpa because they couldn't get the the fake blood to work they couldn't get the tube to like pour out blood and they were just like you know what screw it let's just get this done i'm gonna cut you open a little bit on your finger and let's just get through this scene kind of thing like it's really disgusting because especially like you know grandpa latches on to that finger yeah and he was sucking real human blood yeah yeah oh sally like running through the forest and everything like she really injured herself getting through all of that like running through the branches like a lot of the blood by the end of the movie on her clothes is actually her real blood so you know again kudos to her for selling it and you know staying in character for all that because i would have been taking me to the hospital like asap (laughs) yeah and just even like the chainsaw like this is a point in time when the effects are very practical and they're using a real chainsaw here there are like moments where like that chainsaw could have killed somebody. Like there's a, I think it's Kirk in, there's a moment where the actor playing Leatherface is basically like, if you move even like an inch, I'm going to kill you with this chainsaw. So like you have to Please like- Please don't move. Yeah. yeah. And, or like other spots where they actually, the last shot was the, that they filmed was the shot of Leatherface dropping the chainsaw on his own leg. And so what they did was it like, again, real chainsaw. They put a piece of metal over his leg where they were going to drop it. And then they put meat on top of that. And then they kept doing the take over and over again where it would cut into his leg and cut into the meat but the problem was is the chainsaw is still heavy and still in motion and it's banging into the metal there and that's still causing injury to the guy's leg i think i read another story where gunner the guy playing leatherface Mm -hmm. i think he tripped and dropped the chainsaw and almost took his own head off yeah like Like it it, yeah scary genuinely scary like making this movie apparently everyone hated toby hooper by the end of the production yes yeah, yeah that was one of those things that i read that i had a good chuckle at like this was one of those like absolute hell shots that kind of turned into something magic special yeah, yeah. And special but it took a long time for anybody to forgive him and that's why we got the beautiful like dance around at the end of the chainsaw right, is right. because gunner the the actor who played leatherface was just like so sick of it he was just like i'm just gonna do whatever and like make a mockery of this at the end and toby hooper was like that's brilliant it's yeah. going in the movie <laughs> <laughs> because Ta- it was brilliant task failed successfully yeah 100 <laughs> percent I also liked, do you ever notice that Leatherface changed faces throughout the you movie? You know, I didn't actually notice. Really? Really. I, it wasn't until I reading afterwards. I was like, oh, oh all right. I, see, I noticed it, but it was very subtle. Like, it it was subtle to the point where I was questioning whether I was crazy or not. And, what, and it was the kitchen scene where I was like, no, he is changing faces. But I definitely recognized a, a subtle difference from him doing the meat preparation to him chasing the girl 
you know, around uh, at night kind of thing. I'm sure it was obvious. It's just my attention to detail is not always. No, it great. was very subtle. It was very subtle. But the the pretty woman mask is what they call it uh, at the dinner scene. That was the one that like I was like, OK, I, I see it now. I see the makeup and everything. And I see there's a difference in like the hair and everything. You know, incorporating all of that, like they really thought about the character of Leatherface and being a blank slate underneath the mask. And like those these slight variations to the masks that he's wearing are really like the change in what the character is trying to be in each different scene kind of thing. Because you've got the first scene where Leatherface is wearing like a... Uh, I can't remember what it was called. Like, I think it was the old lady mask where like being like the stay at home, like a homemaker, the yeah. homemaker kind of thing and making the meat and all of that. And then you've got the killer mask and then you've got the, the pretty woman mask, which is like a Southern thing apparently where, you know, you get really decked out for dinner at night kind of thing. Like it's, it, that's like kind of a customary thing of the South. Is it? Yeah. Oh, interesting. So the kind of the idea was that they're kind of trying to like outwardly portray a personality on this character where there is no personality or anything below the surface of this mask. And I think that's why Leatherface is weirdly compelling because he commits the most acts of brutality, but he's almost like the least evil of the three brothers. Right. And like, you're right, we get nothing from him. And there's that scene where like the old man is kind of whacking him around. Yep. And he's like, ah, oh, you damn fool. Why'd you take out the door? And yep. like, you know, there's part of you that's like, why isn't this guy just whopping the floor with this old man right, because right? there's a little you can like throw the littlest bit of empathy towards leatherface for being this almost tragic character who like is just has nothing like he's like he's disabled and, and he's like a victim of abuse yeah too. exactly like, like it's really it's really interesting like that they went with that angle it's so unexpected coming into this movie like 50 years later but not knowing a whole lot about all of the subsequent films and like how many times Leatherface is grace the screens to know like almost there's almost a little bit of tragedy in the character as well. It's definitely interesting. And like, again, like you see him getting whacked, smacked around by this old man. And it's like, you know, you're like, oh, OK, like it's almost like it's like this old story about how like when elephants are babies, they tie them, you know, they put a rope around their neck and tie them to a post or something. And then when they're fully grown, even though they're strong enough to break the rope they won't do it right right there's now, it, this is what an episode like i've been talking about weird <laughs> things i saw in parking lots i've been talking about weird adventures i had as a journalist and now i'm talking about elephants like i think it speaks to maybe some of the somehow relatability of this movie like there's something i think it speaks to my undiagnosed adhd <laughs> <laughs> fair enough yeah look back at the times we talked about how people walked out of this movie and how horrific it was it was actually the 12th biggest movie of 1974 which is kind of wild like that is wild <laughs> because it's like a micro budget independent horror movie like it actually took of all things halloween to surpass it in the independent movie world Circuit? in terms of yeah in terms of like its size and its scope and its impact i think that this is such a back and forth and interesting discussion that i never really got a clear answer out of this but there's a lot of rumors online about whether or not the director was trying to make this a pg movie whether or not the like director was going for an r-rated movie or what but there were things that i was reading online that were saying like that the director was trying to get a PG rating and cut out a lot of like the more graphic stuff of this movie. And that part is true that he did cut some graphic stuff out because originally they were going to give him the 18 plus, like, which is NC-17. Yeah, yeah. The NC-17. Has there is... ever been a successful NC-17 oh, movie? Oh, I'm sure there has. I think... Um, the, like, Natural the... Born Killers? Maybe. American History X? There's like a cowboy one with John Vaught and Dustin John, Hoffman. John Voight? Yeah. Midnight Cowboy. That's it. I believe Midnight Cowboy might be NC-17. I've never even heard of it. No, we'll do it on the podcast at some point. It's very, you know, the, hey, I'm walking here. Like, oh, is that where that comes that's from? That's where that oh, comes well, from. Oh, you're right. Dustin now, Hoffman. Now yep. we need <laughs> Dustin fucking Hoffman. You know what else we need to do is The Graduate. Yeah, I, actually, I haven't seen The Graduate I watched it for either. the first time a couple years ago. It holds up really well. Yeah, I'd like to watch it. So yeah, I don't know really where this movie was supposed to be if it was supposed to be pg or if that's just like an an urban legend or what but that's kind of interesting that he did ultimately work with like the board to kind of make this movie less graphic in a sense despite like how horrifying it still manages to be yeah and i think that's a testament to the strength of the script in this movie that there actually isn't much gore but like it's right. nerve-wracking yeah on that note too in the 70s like this movie comes out gets banned in 
a lot of countries, like well over like a hundred countries or something wild like that. Like it has a super limited theatrical release because there's so much outcry, like people walking out of theaters after seeing this one. Like, again, it kind of, in a sense, reminds me of something like the substance where, you know, it just goes out in a few movie theaters. People are walking out because of how disgusting it is. Yeah. And But there's something to, like, that film as well and the movie making behind that film that I really appreciated. Well, I appreciate a work of art that's willing to double down. Yeah. You know, and just like, no, this is what this movie's about. Like, right. you're, you're either rolling with it or you're not. Yeah, and I think that those are the movies that tend to hold up the test of time is like when somebody when somebody has an artistic vision and is allowed to like fully execute on it and lean into it and and make something original and like unexpected in a sense right yeah and i think sometimes that can only happen outside the studio system yeah because this was i don't know how toby hooper got 140 thousand dollars but oh that that's a whole separate story and i'm sure if you watch that documentary do you know what the documentary is called i don't it's okay. just i can look it up real quick okay but yeah like there's a whole like side discussion about the making of this movie and like they got some financing from somebody and that guy screwed them over and like tried to and that the i guess the production company tried to steal all of the money from this movie and it went into bankruptcy after they like lost a court case and it's like this movie is kind of a whole big mess and it's kind of surprising that this movie has been able to live on because of how much drama has gone on behind the scenes and that this movie is accessible because in a way that this movie could be something that could get lost like to time over the period of like the 70s to the 90s because of how troubled it was behind the scenes how much fraud and other crazy stuff went on so there's probably a mini series here is what you're saying Probably, like yeah. Like a docu-series. Like The Offer. Like, uh, The Godfather has The Offer, which is a really exciting miniseries that I... One of my favorites of last year, actually, that I yeah, really Yeah, yeah. No, it's interesting. Um, You know, it comes out, and it's, like, a mixed reception because nobody knows what to do with this movie. Like, Roger Ebert respected the filmmaking, thought the story was really interesting and unique, and, like, really applauded it, but also was, like, kind of grossed out by the gore and stuff like that. I don't feel like this was a Roger Ebert movie. No, but yeah. he still appreciated, like, the filmmaking on, on display here right okay okay but now it's like you know it's still considered one of the most controversial movies of all time but it's also and well earned the scary one of the scariest movies of all time um like it's constantly ranked in the top five scariest horror movies of all time like right up there with something like the exorcist which i don't even know that the exorcist holds up to the same degree that the texas chainsaw massacre holds up but that's we'll have to do the that very soon i i really want to watch the original exorcist again you know i watched it last year and it's it's fine yeah yeah i think that it again that taps into some 70s fear and paranoia that maybe we has kind of lessened now to a degree and like i don't know if that movie holds up because i don't know that we as a society kind of still have the same anxieties that the well, 70s now i'm did. not i'm not scared of demons anymore i'm scared of <laughs> the scourge of male pattern baldness <laughs> <laughs> fair enough personal reviews and the partner factor i mean you know we, you and i have kind of praised this movie throughout so this feels like a pretty easy like i loved this movie i thought it lived up it lived up to the hype and even surpassed my expectations for this movie and again this is the best way for michael to experience this kind of movie is wandering in knowing nothing right and i wandered in knowing nothing yeah and like, i've come out with the knowledge that the world is a darker and bleaker place than i imagined <laughs> possible my initial reaction like the what i wrote down and it's what i said as soon as the credits started rolling was well that was fucking wild <laughs> Yeah, that too. Genuinely speaking, like, this is one of the best horror movies I've ever seen. Like, this would go... This is in my top probably five favorite horror movies of all time. And, you know, as people who have listened to this podcast know, I like, I... I love horror movies. I love the elevated nature of the horror movies in the last 10 years, like stuff like It Follows. I love The Thing. It's one of my top four favorite movies of all time. Like, generally speaking, I think, actually, for a pattern of this movie podcast this will be our third year of doing our best of i think that there's been a horror movie on my top five list every year since the inception of this like i love horror movies and i thought this movie was a cut above a lot of horror above movies. the rest eh? Yeah. yeah this might actually surprisingly make it onto my top five we kind of talked about that before we started how our top five lists are going and i wouldn't be shocked if this one ends up on there either for me no no definitely not i think with horror movies i think what 
people s- go to horror movies and what people expect out of horror movies is like to be disturbed or disgusted or something like that. But sometimes what people or what's underappreciated about horror movies is that horror movies can sometimes be an outlet for somebody who's extremely creative to put something on screen that we've never seen before. And it oftentimes is like a a hungry like filmmaker who hasn't gotten an opportunity yet to make something incredible and horror movies are a good low stakes place to kind of unleash somebody into the world of filmmaking well how many famous directors started off in horror like a lot of them well even like jordan peele of recent like Mm -hmm. you know pivoting from comedy tv to horror movies and like genuinely impressed with him his filmmaking style same thing with the guy who made Barbarian from The Whitest Kids You Know. Yeah, Peter Jackson started off in horror. Peter Jackson started off in horror. David Fincher started off in horror, although... Well, he started, off with, Al- that. He started off with Alien Exactly, Free. but still horror, though, right? I'm pretty sure didn't James Cameron technically start off in horror as well? Did he? Wasn't it Piranha 2 or some shit? Yeah, I think it was Piranha 2 that he started in. Like, it's all of these... And Piranha 2 is not considered a good movie, right? But Michael Bay started off in horror because all his movies scare me with their existential (laughs) emptiness. I'm sorry, that was a cheap shot, Uh, Michael. That's great. I've been talking a lot, so you do your reaction to this movie in your review i watched this movie by myself when i had a window of time yesterday between things i had to do yep and i liked it a lot yeah i liked it a lot and i might even watch it again this year wow yeah it was good i enjoyed this more than i thought i would actually this might have been one of the better viewing experiences i've had this year and just by yourself too and there's something to watching this movie by yourself where you're just there's no one there's no one else to turn to to be like, hello? <laughs> like I actually have a really interesting anecdote about that as well because Jess started watching this movie with me and then had to go to work. So she probably got up to just after the hitchhiker scene and then we get to the house and everything and that's when she started getting ready for work and leaving. But her and I watching like the hitchhiker scene together, like we were both sitting there like oh like really upset and like like of what the fuck both reacting together kind of thing and like we were both like quietly watching in just utter horror as the scene plays out and like it's not all that gory it's not that disgusting but there's just something so wrong about this character sitting in this van and like doing weird off-putting things and like speaking in a jarbled mess and just all of this compounds into like one of the scariest scenes of this year for me. Honestly, yeah. I'd say the hitchhiker scene might actually be the peak. Mm-hmm. The pure cinema moment. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Although and maybe the dinner scene comes close. I'm not going to argue that like there's different scenes. There's different strokes for different folks in this movie. Like There's different things that you might latch onto. But for me personally, the hitchhiker scene was just so goddamn good. And I wouldn't even say that I was disappointed with the rest of the movie. It was just... I was really genuinely impressed with that opening 20 minutes. Yeah. No, I I agree. I definitely agree. I think starting a movie, horror movie off on that level of a high note and being able to continue like to scare me and unsettle me, it really, again, speaks to the craftsmanship of this movie. Absolutely. 10 out of 10. Genuinely, like... I'm sorry all those young actors in the 70s had to suffer through the worst filming conditions of their life, but it's kind of worth it. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I mean, this is a movie that's going to be talked about 50 years from now. Well, clearly, here we are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I mean, another 50 years from now. (laughs) Oh, well, maybe we'll still be here doing this. Yeah, that'd be fun. When we're 81. (laughs) Yeah. We're like, Blake, I think we did this one already. I mean, I think we have enough movies to talk about. I've got like 600 movies on our watch list right now. That'll keep us busy. That'll keep us busy. (laughs) Yeah, 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 exactly. But you're like, Blake, I think we watched this one already. Yeah. Now we got to hurry up and do this podcast before the robot overlords send us back to the Emerald Mines. I'm glad that I finally got to see the Texas Chainsaw Massacre movie, and it definitely is my number one slasher movie of all time now. It's up there for me, too. I'm not even a huge horror movie guy, but this is definitely up there. And yeah, I guess let us know what you think of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre and if you had a good time with us today, but uh, or if you had a miserable horrible time with us today <laughs> hey engagement is engagement yeah. sound off in the comments exactly i know but i hope i hope we'll go and check this one out because i had a blast so until next time tell your dad and ladies remember to use this as a screening device for your potential <laughs> romantic partners <laughs> yeah okay see you next time <laughs>